Okay, uh, welcome everyone who is here. My name is Dan Thompson. I'm the Dean of Fine Arts at Studio and Caminati, and I'd like to uh, again welcome you to what will be our final uh, Bennett Schmidt lecture on the higher aim of art for Studio in Caminati, which is our school, our wonderful inner city scrappy realist based fine art school in Philadelphia, uh, where uh, we have really benefited this year so much from uh, the, the few experts that we have sought out on a variety of, of important things that we study within Incominati. Uh, we're a realist art school. We look at various things like portraiture and history uh, and, and many such um, you know, aspects of what we do. Tonight, we have a very special lecture from Professor Jesse Locker, uh, where he is going to talk about how to become a, an artist in Baroque Rome. Um, a couple of uh, words of introduction about Professor Locker. Uh, this is his cover image here. Uh, Dr. Professor Locker has a doctorate of, in art history from Johns Hopkins University, as well as his master's from the same university. Uh, he earned his uh, BA in art history from the University of Washington. And he currently serves uh, from 2015 until today as Professor of Renaissance and Baroque Art at Portland State University. Uh, he is the recipient of, of many prizes, including in 2019, the Renaissance Society of America, the Samuel H. Kress Research Fellowship in Renaissance Art History for the project Il Sordo in search for a deaf painter in Spanish Milan. In 2017, he received the Helen and Howard R. Moraro Prize in Italian History from the Society for Italian Historical Studies for Artemisia Gentileschi, the language of painting at Yale University, uh, for Yale University Press in 2015. As well as the, in, for the same book, he received uh, the 2015 Choice uh, Outstanding Academic Title. He has written extensively uh, for a number of different publications, uh, just a few of which I've listed here. Um, essay, Artemisia, Lucretia, and Venice. Uh, he's written on Caravaggio. Uh, you can see he's written on the light of Naples. Uh, he has written about women artists in early modern Italy. Uh, he has written, uh, as I said, extensively, as well as edited uh, texts. Uh, he edited art and reform in late Renaissance, in the late Renaissance after Trent in 2018 which you can pick up. And we will uh, include this image on the video uh, of tonight's lecture at the end as well. And his most notable work, which many of you may be familiar with, and if you aren't, you certainly will be after tonight, and that is Artemisia Gentileschi, The Language of Painting, uh, which he wrote and is published for Yale University Press in 2015. And I'm given to understand will be released again in soft cover in 2021. Is that right, Professor? Yeah, in just a couple of weeks, actually. Just a couple of weeks. So uh, to set some context, um, you know, the language of painting is something which really uh, appeals to us. Uh, we are uh, the kind of audience that I was explaining to Professor Locker uh, almost wants to embody painters like Artemisia and Orazio. Uh, we were formed by and uh, founded by an artist from Philadelphia named Nelson Shanks, who was a, a real aficionado of Baroque painting. And so uh, a great many of us used to go to his, his home, uh, he and his wife Leona's house, and look at these amazing Baroque masters. So uh, we actually have techniques that we've uh, developed and continue developing together, which are inspired by Baroque painting. We have a technique called duotone, which is a essentially an approach to painting which builds up a grisaille and warm and cool temperatures. And it's inspired by some of the pieces that we, we would see over at Chelwood uh, by, by Dossi and uh, Van Dyck, they own a Van Dyck, uh, by Karachi, by Nibale Karachi, they own a, a Guido Cagnacci. So uh, a lot of this has, has kind of um, percolated into our program in so much as we've attempted to um, aspire to this kind of greatness. Uh, in addition, we, we paint texture, uh, we look at color, and we, we hope to emulate uh, painters like Caravaggio, uh, who went to nature uh, in, in so much as we look at our palette and expanding the palette. So we've tried to emulate in many ways 
Uh, we've also coordinated with several of the um, uh, other schools in the, in the immediate vicinity, uh, such as Jefferson, where we've been drawing from cadavers. And it's, it's been a kind of uh, unprecedented effort on our part to, uh, to get set into a situation where we have models posing with cadavers uh, so that we can get that interested in that uh, intrigue with the complexities of the human body. And of course, with, with that and with art history, uh, we've developed a, you know, a pretty robust attention to the human body. So uh, this notion of the language of painting really appeals to us, uh, Professor, and we really appreciate you being here. I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and talking to us about the practical realities of living and working in you know, Baroque Rome. Uh, given the school's name, I won't ask you what it's like to be an artist in Baroque Bologna, but uh, I think I should let you take the floor, so I'll stop sharing. Thank you all so much. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Dan, for that kind introduction, and uh, thanks as well to Jared Fisher for help with the technical aspects of this. Um, and I especially wanted to thank uh, Steve Bennett and Elaine Schmidt for making this whole series possible and for inviting me to come speak to you all. Um, so in some ways, this is a topic that all of you as part of a school called the Incaminati already know a great deal about. And in some ways, I would say, you probably know more about it than I do. That is, um, what I'm going to be talking about is some of the studio and um, so you might say marketing practices of artists in the 17th century. That is, I'm phrasing the question is, how is it that you would become an artist in Baroque Rome? What is it you needed to do to follow that path? So some of it will be very familiar to all of you, though other aspects I'm suspecting are going to be um, quite foreign and really very remote to how we might think of art today. Um, but really for all of you, um, part of the studio in Caminati are indebted to many of the practices that were developed in the 16th and 17th century. Um, and as you probably all know, your own school uh, was named after the Accademia degli Incaminati, founded in 1582 by the Caracci, Anibale, Agostino, and Ludovico. Um, and their name um, referred to the idea of them as travelers on a path, uh, moving upward eternally toward an unreachable perfection. That is, you would always strive to become better and better, um, no matter where you were in that journey. So your school and all of you in the audience tonight are rooted very much in that tradition. So the question really is, is what it took um, to become an artist during that time. And I should say right off that much of what I wanna to talk to you about this evening is indebted to scholars um, Julian Brooks, and especially Patrizia Cavazzini, who's done a great deal of research in the archives um, in terms of the day-to-day -day experiences of artists in 17th century Rome. But I thought I could start with this image here, which is a somewhat idealized picture of an artist workshop, right at the cusp of the period that we're talking about. So about 1595. Now this particular image happens to be from Antwerp, but it gives um, a good, if somewhat idealized, representation of how an artist studio should function. Uh, it works in some ways simultaneously as a school, uh, but also as a workshop that um, produces objects that um, are sold to people. And so we can see these various functions here. Um, on the right, we can see assistants um, grinding pigments, making preparations uh, for canvases. Here seems to be a very young student who's just simply copying uh, from a book. It's a little hard to tell what he's copying, but he, often there's eyes or ears or things like that. Um, here, 
a more advanced student who's preparing paints um, while the master applies them here onto a painting of St. George. Right here, a student, again, younger, but not quite as young as this one, uh, who's copying from uh, a sculpture bust, maybe an ancient Roman one or a cast of one. Um, and then in the background, we have uh, a portrait being done from life. Maybe there's another master in the studio or one of the more advanced assistants laying out the portrait um, as um, the woman having her portrait painted is chaperoned here. In the back, we can see a painting of a Virgin Mary, maybe an altarpiece, a religious commission. Um, so we see all the stages of the development of the artist. And this seems to be a harmonious workshop uh, where everything is functioning exactly as it should, each in the stages of their education, each carrying out tasks that are appropriate to that, um, all in the service of uh, creating works of art that will go out to either churches or to uh, wealthy families who commission a portrait. Now, as I said, this is a somewhat idealized picture and it is from Antwerp. So it's going to be a little bit different than how practice was in Italy. Um, to get a sense of how the trajectory of an Italian artist might work, um, I thought a good guide to have for this would be um, the artists Tadeo and Federico Zuccari. Now, they are not household no names today, but um, Federico in particular was perhaps the most famous artist of his own day throughout Europe. He traveled widely, had the most important expensive commissions, um, and he was the head of the Academia de San Luca, that is uh, the Artists Academy in Rome. And he used this position to influence the education of young artists. And he commissioned a series uh, for uh, his family palace, uh, the Palazzo Zuccari in Rome with its remarkable um, <laughs> doorway that looks like a mouth. Um, he commissioned a fresco cycle um, that was intended to instruct young artists on kind of the ideal journey and the different virtues that they would need to cultivate in order to become successful artists in Italy um, at the tail end of the 16th century. So um, this, in preparation for this cycle, uh, he did a series of just incredibly charming um, ink drawings um, that I think are actually far superior to the final fresco that they were designed for but they make a perfect guide to what, at least according to Federico Zucchero, would be the journey that an artist should take. Now they're based on the story of the life of his brother, Tadeo. Uh, Tadeo was older than he was, uh, had gone to Rome, uh, become quite successful, um, but died very young in his thirties uh, around uh, 1566. Um, he was so successful that he was buried in the Pantheon next to Raphael um, and became very much a role model for his younger brother Federico. He also became for Federico this kind of paradigmatic artist, an exemplum of what an artist could and should do. And so this cycle represents different key moments in the life of Tadeo. But I think we'll quickly see that these are not probably um, just taken snapshots of life, but in fact, kind of moralizing, idealizing um, images meant to teach a lesson to young students. So let's start with this. Uh, this is, represents young Tadeo leaving home um, and here he's shown being escorted by two guardian angels. Now we can be pretty sure it didn't happen exactly like this, um, but it gives a sense of, of the spirit of the event. Um, Tadeo, who's labeled as are all the figures uh, quite nicely here, um, is shown as maybe a little younger than he probably could have been. Uh, most students left to enter training around 
um, as early as 11 years old and um, as old as 17. Uh, Tadeo was probably about 12 when he left. So in the picture, he looks a bit younger. And then we have little Federico uh, clinging to his mother's skirts um, as he leaves home and his tearful parents um, hoping he'll have luck along his journey. Um, here he's shown entering the gates of Rome. Uh, he's greeted by allegories. Uh, these are toil, servitude, hardship, and obedience and patience uh, represented. The ass and the ox represent obedience and patience. All the virtues that he's going to need to make it in the competitive environment of Rome. Uh, Rome was not like other cities like Florence or Venice where there was a highly organized workshop system. Uh, it really took uh, much more toil and independence uh, to become an artist there. It's a fascinating little image because we can also see here is the Dome of St. Peter's, not yet complete, um, designed by Michelangelo, but continued to be built after his death. So we see bits of old and new St. Peter's. We see here the Vatican obelisk, which uh, would eventually be moved uh, to St. Peter's Square, but at this point was still here. Um, his first effort is unsuccessful. They had a distant cousin in Rome named Francesco il Sant'Angelo. Uh, <laughs> poor Tadeo is rejected. He says, no, I don't have any work for you. Go away, more or less here. He's shown here weeping. Um, as he leaves though, however, you see him back here trying to figure out what to do with himself. And he's looking at this painted facade uh, by Polidoro da Caravaggio. These painted frescoes uh, were very popular in, in the later 16th century, and he's admiring this. You can also see here the Pantheon for a little local color. Um, he finally finds work, an apprenticeship in the studio of someone named Giovanni Piero Calabrese, um, but it's not that great. Um, he's mostly um, doing kind of menial work. Here he's shown grinding colors while Calabrese's wife sits and warms her feet by the fire. Uh, Calabrese is looking at a Raphael drawing here. The inscriptions tell us that, but he won't even let uh, young Tadeo look at it. All he wants is to learn and he won't let him do that. And even probably worst of all, he keeps this basket of bread uh, tied to the ceiling with a rope and a bell. So he'll know if uh, young Tadeo is uh, stealing food. Um, here he's shown in Calabrese's house doing various tasks for his wife, making the bed, bringing wood up, starting a fire, um, lighting a fire. Um, and in the background, we can see uh, Castel Sant'Angelo. Now this may seem cruel, um, but it was in fact fairly normal uh, for uh, young apprentices. Often um, their parents would pay uh, for their training or in lieu of paying, they might do work for the master. It could be things related to art, but it might actually be um, just doing housework of this kind. But in this case, he's not really getting proper training He's not even allowed to look at a Raphael drawing. Um, and so he goes off on his own at night and explores Rome. And he's so dedicated to his craft uh, that he's here shown drawing uh, frescoes by Raphael in the Villa Farnesina, um, which apparently was open and accessible um, at night at the time. So here he is drawing. Here he's shown that he's fallen asleep in the middle of his labors because he's doing chores for Calabrese all day and, and uh, at night drawing. And here we can see you know, exactly where he is. This is the Lodge of Psyche in the Villa Fonerzina. Um, and this is what he's looking up at. And again, it's been glassed in uh, since, since Zucre's day. Also, he's shown drawing the antiquities of Rome. Um, this was considered the main lure of coming to Rome. 
was that you could build on the legacy of the ancients, draw directly um, from their creations. And we can see in this work, there's a canon uh, that's already quite formed of which ancient works are the most famous and the most worthy of emulation. Um, and um, so if we look here, this is the Laokuan, Apollo Belvedere. He's in the Belvedere courtyard. And that's these works here, um, both of which were uncovered in the 16th century and quickly entered the canon of what every aspiring artist would study. We also, um, sorry, that inscription is actually incorrect. Um, here he's drawing Michelangelo's Last Judgment. Um, and we can see there's, uh, it's the sort of bottom left-hand corner where uh, the dead are coming out of their graves and ascending upward toward heaven. Um, and he has a, his hat on the floor and a scarf tied around his head um, as he's working, uh, imitating, you know, the greatest of the 16th century masters, Michelangelo. Finally, after all this labor, um, he's all 18 years old and he receives his most prestigious public commission. It's to decorate the facade of a noble palace in Rome, the Palazzo Mattei. Uh, Palazzo Mattei still exists, though unfortunately these outdoor frescoes um, have faded over time. Um, in this image, um, it's completed. There's uh, allegories of victory on either side and um, everyone has come to look including Michelangelo and Vasari, uh, who are admiring his work um, and other artists like um, Salviati. So this is a story of triumph, um, perseverance over adversity, and it's really through sheer determination, even if his teachers weren't great, um, to dedicate himself to study from the ancient masters, uh, from the uh, modern masters as well, like Michelangelo and Raphael, um, and to reach glory and fame because of that. So even though it's roughly based on his brother's life, it is still, as we've seen, kind of idealized and, and moralizing. That is, if you just do these things and dedicate yourself you will um, attain great things. And it's a good way to inspire students. The real process though, was probably more complex, um, even if Zucchero shows some of the difficulties that, that artists might have faced. Um, so I just wanna show you right here is, is the frontispiece to a manual um, for aspiring artists. Um, by someone named Eduardo Fialetti. It was published in Venice in 1608. And it kind of compiles many of the ideas about um, artistic education in the late 16th and, and early 17th centuries. Um, and uh, we can start by seeing the different stages of uh, artistic development here. Um, we see, as we saw in, in the other picture of the studio, um, a young boy drawing here from plaster casts. Um, we see others working on painting. We see others grinding pigments. Um, we see a young apprentice with a drawing that seems to be being corrected by an older apprentice or, or perhaps uh, the master himself. So we kind of see all the stages of development gathered together in a fictionalized space here. Um, so really the first stage of learning to draw and ultimately of learning to paint was to copy. And um, the youngest students really um, would just simply copy, for example, whole pages full of ears of eyes, of noses, individual parts until uh, they began in some ways to have rote memorization. 
of how to draw these features. Um, I mean, this was a practice that was very, very common. Um, even great artists like uh, Giuseppe de Rivera um, had sheets of eyes and noses, mouths, things like that for his students to draw from. And it was really through repetition uh, that you would master uh, these simple kinds of steps. Um, many of the great artists in Rome had uh, workshops or studios, um, but as I mentioned, they weren't as strictly organized as the ones in Florence or Venice or, or Northern Europe. Uh, artists like Cavalier Tarpino, Andrea Sacchi, Domenichino, Guido Reni all had stu students and workshops, but it was strangely casual that students could just come in. They might draw a little bit. They might get corrections from the master. They might do a few kind of basic exercises. They might grind pigments in exchange for some advice. Um, but in some ways, students were very much on their own in this period. And so these kind of manuals um, were helpful. Copying, say, like the Belvedere torso was a way to get familiar not only with the human body, but also with antiquity itself without actually seeing it. Um, but, and so we see here, uh, students drawing from the plaster casts. That is once you've moved from, say like this little guy here who looks like he's about four years old, um, <laughs> you uh, might move from copying flat surfaces to um, copying say plaster casts of ancient um, sculpture, um, such as the Belvedere torso. Um, if you were fortunate enough to be in Rome and be able to visit that, um, but, or you could draw from works um, out in the open. This is an example of, uh, by an artist named uh, Swartz, of an artist drawing a statue by Bernini. Um, but the studios themselves also had uh, extensive collections of casts, and I'm guessing you at uh, Studio in Caminati also have some of these. Um, and these were a resource uh, for um, artists to learn as they saw it, kind of the perfection of the ancients, to draw from these ideal human forms um, that had been created uh, by the Greeks and Romans. But just as important, if not more important, um, were uh, what they called academia or academies, um, which today is what we would call a life drawing studio. That is, there were um, live, often nude models hired um, simply for um, life drawing. Sometimes uh, they would be in heated rooms in the winter, sometimes outside in the summer. Um, and artists of all ages, all stages of development would come to these. This is a really charming painting, I think, again, by Michael Swartz. Um, it was done uh, when he had returned uh, to Holland, um, but uh, it seems to be based on his practice in Rome. In any case, we can see students all gathered around, drawing, talking, all different ages. Um, but one thing you will notice is it's all entirely uh, boys or men. Uh, at this point, particularly in Rome, um, there, there was really no tradition of drawing uh, nude women, particularly in this context. Um, and women mostly seem to have been not allowed um, to participate in these um, drawing, drawing, excuse me, life drawing events. Um, though there may be some exceptions. Um, but drawing was so fundamental to learning to be a painter that it was common that students would only draw, not even be able to touch brushes uh, for 10 years, 10 years of drawing, uh, either copying um, the master's drawings, uh, drawing from life, drawing from ancient models um, before you were even allowed to paint at all. Um, so it's not surprising that museums and 
the art market and collections are just absolutely full of life drawings from this era. And that they're notoriously difficult to attribute to one artist or another. Because many of these were part of pedagogical exercises, um, they may have been you know, done by a student and then completed by the master. Uh, they may have had series of different corrections. There are even cases like this um, where it seems to be a student copied a master's drawing from uh, a nude figure. So it's not even drawing after the nude, but rather drawing after the master's drawing. Um, and so there are huge numbers of these. Some of the best are done by artists like Aníbal Ecarachi, but for connoisseurs, these are just a huge problem because trying to sort out which ones are sort of independent life drawings, which are studies for other works, um, which are done by pupils, which are maybe pupils imitating the master, which are you know, pupils drawings corrected by the master. It, it's really a puzzle, um, but what I really just want to emphasize is how central drawing was to um, artistic training at this time. Um, and again, more examples here. Um, finally, eventually, after 10 or 12 years, in some cases, students would be allowed to take up brushes and to paint. Um, and this would have been after years of kind of watching how the master painted, of doing things like grinding pigments, preparing canvases. Um, but the early paintings would be things like this on the right, copies of well-known paintings. Um, so in this case, it's one by Pedro da Cortona after um, Raphael's famous Galatea in the Villa Farnesina. Um, often they would be copies of the master's own works, um, which again presents a real problem in trying to sort out which works are originals, um, which are not. Um, and, you know, we have from records, for example, things that Caravaggio, for example, when he first came to Rome, uh, painted sort of still lifes and landscapes and things like that, small details for uh, artists like Giuseppe Cesare. Now, I've tried, and I know other people have tried, to find elements in these paintings that seem like they could be by Caravaggio. It's hard to see, but in some ways that was the purpose that you were supposed to emulate the master's style. It shouldn't be recognizably different. Um, otherwise, uh, the work will, will not hold together in a unified way. Um, nevertheless, in some cases, and again, this is a Flemish example, but it, it works well enough, we can recognize uh, the hand of a student in a work by the master. You know, the same goes with, say, Leonardo and Verrocchio, but here, and this is a work by uh, Rubens that in many places just very clearly has that kind of lyrical flowy elegance of Van Dyck. Um, and it is pretty clear that he probably did most of this painting, but then Rubens might come back in and kind of paint the most important parts or kind of touch up things, uh, do corrections and things like that. And that was um, part of the process of learning, but also you know, these workshops are creating a product that people want and patrons might be annoyed if they can't recognize uh, the hand of the master in the work. So the ultimate goal of all this training and really the highest pinnacle that you could expect to reach was to uh, create a monumental work of fresco that is in a palace or a church or some other kind of public space. Um, and, you know, the kind of primary example of this uh, is the Farnese Gallery in Rome, painted by Anibale Caracci, as well as, well, Agostino and um, plenty of assistants. Um, but all that practice, all that emulation of the masters, all that drawing, um, of models, 
and so on, um, really found fruition in works like this. And you know, we can see that there are many surviving drawings uh, that relate to each and every single work in the Farnese gallery. Um, and for example, this little life drawing I showed you here seems pretty closely related to um, this, this figure here sitting next to the medallion. So a work like this combines the study of the human figure, study of Michelangelo, of Raphael, of antiquity, um, to the point that, you know, the artists have internalized their sources by repeating them so often that they understand the human body intuitively, they understand Michelangelo and Raphael intuitively, um, they understand uh, the work of the ancients intuitively, and I have been able to synthesize them and come up with kind of a novel interpretation uh, really from, from the hand and, and from the imagination. And along with this, you know, the pupils would uh, have a part in this and the most advanced ones would get a role in you know, creating new works as kind of the final stage of their training. And we can see here this subsidiary scene is um, by Domenichino, who was one of their most important students and from this point on sort of launches into an independent career. <clears throat> the other main outcome of all this training uh, would be to paint a major altarpiece in a church. Um, and this was really where the money was and also uh, fame because churches, in addition to being places of worship, were also almost like museums, places of displaying uh, great works of art and where people would come and admire them or, or maybe make fun of them. But um, it was the surest sign of success as having a major altarpiece in a Roman church. And here, as an example, is uh, Guercino, St. Petronilla, altarpiece uh, for St. Peter's in Rome. A massive, massive work, uh, but showing, you know, how much Guercino had succeeded uh, to get a commission of this type. Um, or works like Carlo Maratta, and he was the head of the Academia de San Luca later on. Um, large scale altarpiece, kind of the sign of having arrived. But there was a big exception to this trajectory that I've been laying out for you. Um, and this was Caravaggio. So Caravaggio was seen as radical and revolutionary because he essentially rejected this whole tradition uh, that required, say, 10 years of drawing just from, uh, you know, models of eyes or ancient sculptures, you know, before you could pick up a brush. His work throws all of that out, and Caravaggio chose to look directly at nature, and as heretical as it sounds, to paint directly on the canvas, uh, ignoring drawing, ignoring all of those um, traditions that are so laid out uh, in the conventions of, say, the Academia de San Luca. Here, he painted Mary Magdalene. Um, he's painted her, had a model pose directly from life. He set out objects on the floor. These are symbolic of Mary Magdalene rejecting earthly vanities. Uh, there's a jar of um, oil that anticipates when later she'll um, wash Jesus's feet in perfumes and oils. Here she is rejecting earthly vanities. Uh, she's placed in a room with a strong light up above. It's a beautiful painting, painted directly from life. He's captured all kind of the particulars of the patterns of her dress and the color. But for traditionalists, this work was shocking and offensive. And Giovan Pietro Bellori, writing in the 1670s, said of it, 
you know, he has painted a girl with some jewels and perfume and would have us believe that she's Mary Magdalene. So for traditionalists, this kind of missed the point of all of that training, which was that you internalize nature. You learn the human body um, by repeating it, by drawing it, by understanding it kind of mechanically through the hand. Caravaggio instead, as they saw it, was completely dependent on the model and of imitating just what he saw in front of him, which in their opinion was something anyone could do. Where was the art in that? That was just being a slave of nature. But a lot of people didn't see it that way, and Caravaggism really swept um, Italy and, and eventually Europe up through the 1620s and 30s. Um, and, you know, we have this wonderful um, painting by Michelangelo Cerquazzi that kind of gives a sense of what that process was like. You would have the model in front of you the whole time. He's not dependent on drawings he made earlier. Here's this old guy painting as Saint, posing as St. Jerome. He's painting directly on canvas here. Is this little brazier to keep him warm, um, you know, in this kind of drafty room. And here's the guy dressed up as St. Jerome. Uh, again, it's painting directly from nature, that intervening process of training, of drawing, of diseño um, is, is completely skipped here. But it could have really stunning, splendid effects. And we can see an artist like Orazio Gentileschi, who was a friend of Caravaggio, um, that this painting directly from the model could create these kind of luminous, touching, poignant, sort of immediate works. Um, this is the Madonna and Child, but in reality, we don't have a lot of symbols that it to show us that's Madonna or Jesus, but just instead this just very tender, moving portrait of um, a woman nursing a young child who's probably just a few months old at most, um, making direct eye contact. It's a kind of luminous, beautiful, very still work. The problem with this method of working is that, well, how do you depict action when you have to have the model pose right in front of you? If you can't you haven't sort of internalized the drawings and paintings of the great masters. Instead, you have to pose everything in front of you and it doesn't always work. Uh, so in this painting, for example, David is supposed to be killing Goliath. He's lifted this huge sword above his head. It's clear that they were posed in the studio at two different times. This big Goliath, we can't really believe that they're actually in the same space, right? And there's some very odd things going on with his foot here, his sword just way too big. Here he's probably leaning against the wall of the studio for support. Um, and then the outdoor space does not seem to fit. So there are problems with his method of working depending on, on who's doing it. The other problem was also just financial. Um, Orazio's daughter, Artemisia um, later complained um, that expenses from uh, hiring nude women are so high because out of the 50 women who undress themselves, there's scarcely one good one. So you had to find models that looked exactly like you wanted uh, because um, painting from the imagination wasn't a possibility. Okay, so in terms of uh, returning to Caravaggio, let's, the next step in, in your career, once you've established yourself as young Caravaggio did, um, is to find some kind of patron. And oftentimes this would, in Rome, would be um, a cardinal, ideally from your home region, um, and they might take you under your wing, under their wing, and uh, arrange 
through their connections, say for you to paint an altarpiece in their um, local church or give you other kinds of commissions. And so that's what happened with Caravaggio in the case of Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte, um, whose uh, palace um, is right here, right next to uh, the Church of San Luigi de Francesi um, in Rome. And uh, it was fortuitous for Caravaggio because the Cardinal arranged for the young, relatively inexperienced painter uh, to paint a major series for a chapel in this church. Now, I won't go into all the details of it, but it was for a French cardinal named Mathieu Contrel or Matteo Contrelli, as he was called in Italian, and dedicated uh, to St. Matthew, his name saint. Um, here is the most famous. This is the calling of St. Matthew, where we see uh, Caravaggio's characteristic use of light and dark, tenebrism, um, and uh, his treatment of figures in kind of everyday costume, um, reenacting biblical stories. So this one is the calling of St. Matthew. Uh, we can see here is Jesus summoning him um, as they're playing cards or counting money um, at the table. But the work opposite this is the martyrdom of St. Matthew. And here is where we see where Caravaggio ran into some problems because of his lack of traditional training. That is, he had to paint figures from life, have them pose uh, in front of him in order to paint them. Now, he's managed to resolve it. It's a bit ambiguous, but here, St. Matthew has been knocked down while celebrating mass. Here's an executioner who's going to kill him. There's a kind of chaos swirling out from this picture. But if we look at the x-rays, we see that Caravaggio had a really hard time. He didn't really know how to paint, say, an architectural setting. He had a lot of trouble with figures in motion. Um, and he's composing it all right on the canvas because he didn't do drawings. So we have layers of pentamenti, that is, sort of rejected compositions uh, underneath this. And we can see that eventually he kind of gave up on trying to create all this movement of having this architecture in the background. Um, and instead, this characteristic strong chiaroscuro uh, is what makes the work um, successful and kind of unifies it in this kind of darkness um, as his critics suggested it was, you know, to hide what they saw as weak drawing. So he always had problems. Well, not always, but often had problems. Um, and some of them did in fact stem from this dependence on having the figure in front of him. This is a monumental, beautiful work now in the Louvre, uh, painted for the Church of Santa Maria della Scala in Rome. It's supposed to be the Dormition of the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary didn't die like ordinary people, but instead went into kind of sleep-like state. Um, but here she's shown, well, really, really dead um, and being grieved by the disciples here. It's a very poignant, example of storytelling, beautiful piece of painting, but theologically, it was hard for him to paint, say, angels and saints and miracles happening because you can't see them. And so the work was rejected and replaced by this probably <laughs> inferior work artistically uh, by Carlo Saraceni, but Saraceni had a more kind of traditional training so he could paint things that couldn't be seen. That is angels coming down on the clouds, sprinkling flowers. Here she's shown very much uh, still alive and active. It's a much more theologically correct painting. Whereas here, 
um, contemporaries even claimed that he had based the body on a drowned prostitute that had been pulled out of the Tiber River. It was just simply too lifelike. And it's still in the church um, to this day. So I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit in the interest of time. Um, but as I've said, you know, the highest anyone could hope to achieve was uh, to either paint a monumental fresco cycle or a major altarpiece. Both of those were very public works. They were how you built your reputation. They were how you made money. But the rea reality is that many painters just didn't have the opportunity or the talent um, to paint in those contexts. And the real bread and butter for many artists at this time um, was painting sort of small scale, simple devotional or decorative works. So random examples might be this Virgin and Child by Angela Caracelli. Um, you know, it's a small work that a relatively ordinary person could afford. Um, and, you know, artistically, maybe not the most stunning, but, you know, uh, somewhere middle of the market, maybe. There were also painters of still lifes. These were collected, but again, there wasn't kind of the glory or money attached to works like this, um, though it's what um, numerous artists were turning out. Um, also kind of small scale works on copper landscapes, for example. This is a stunning one by an artist named Adam Elsheimer uh, from Germany, but lived in Rome. But a lot of artists um, were just barely scraping by. And Elsheimer was one of them with this little drawing of him. Hopefully this scene doesn't look too familiar to all of you, but here's the artist in despair. Um, he's at his table with various allegorical objects on it and children opening the cupboard, trying to find something to eat. Um, it was hard to get by for some artists and many of them had other jobs. Some would be soldiers, pharmacists, all kinds of different professions and they might paint on the side or change careers. One of the most important exceptions um, that we start seeing in this time is the rise of what's called the cabinet picture. That is what we would probably call paintings uh, today. That is works that aren't altarpieces. They aren't frescoes. They're portable, independent works of art meant to hang on the wall and simply to be admired for their artistic qualities. And here's an example, probably not from Rome, um, but of what an interior might have looked like at the time with these kind of rows of paintings. Um, and artists were creating works for this context. Um, so women artists is something we haven't touched on, but I would just say briefly here, women were excluded from the kind of training that we've been talking about so far. Um, they were not allowed to enroll um, in workshops to become pupils. Um, they generally could not go to uh, the academia, the life drawing studios, um, and they were very sheltered. The few successful women artists we have from this time um, is because their fathers were painters. So they learned directly from their fathers and that was really the only way they could get any kind of training. Um, Artemisia Gentileschi is the most famous example um, in her early years in her father's house, she painted in a way that's almost indistinguishable from her father, though her own style kind of emerges. Um, but she had to find strategies um, to uh, make a name for herself because of the handicap of being a woman in the 17th century. So part of the way she did this was through painting extremely shocking subjects um, that would garner attention. Many of these have prominent 
signatures on them, and they feature women um, as the central characters, um, as a kind of calling card that, you know, indeed it was a woman who painted this. And so this is one of her most famous is uh, the biblical heroine Judith de decapitating um, the Assyrian general Holofernes. It's a gruesome, bloody painting, but also kind of beautifully painted and that kind of contrast between uh, the beautiful fabrics and you know, the gory content and knowing it by it was a woman was a way of kind of drawing attention. But Artemisia painted many pictures of this type, these cabinet pictures to go on the walls of um, noble collections, but she didn't in fact do uh, her first altarpiece until some 20 years later in Naples, um, which is uh, this Annunciation. So, you know, these kind of major commissions were elusive. I don't know if any women painted them generally before um, Artemisia. Another artist who took a kind of unconventional approach was Salvador Rosa. Salvador Rosa is really one of the most fascinating characters of the 17th century, um, wildly independent, um, almost hilariously narcissistic and sort of a braggart like a rap star in terms of how he talked about himself and his work. Um, but he took advantage of uh, exhibitions that were held annually um, at the Pantheon in Rome, uh, San Giovanni de Colato in Rome, and, and a few other places uh, where artists would be allowed to display their work. Um, he painted works that were deliberately sort of attention grabbing um, and uh, would even have friends, you know, say things among the crowd. Do you know that Salvador Rosa isn't afraid of Titian or Veronese or Gorchino? Or have you heard about Salvador's work? Um, uh, very much trying to market his work and create a sort of hype about it. Um, so these exhibitions, relatively little is known about them. Um, we have a much later example of this kind of thing in Venice. We can see in Canaletto's painting um, of the Feast Day of St. Roche. Um, there's a whole bunch of paintings displayed as part of these religious festivities. So it was probably something like that. Um, the only other painting that we know of that was displayed at these was uh, Velasquez when he was in Rome, uh, did this portrait of Juan de Pareja. Juan de Pareja was, was a man of Moorish origin who was in fact Velasquez's slave. Velasquez taught him to paint and eventually freed him, but that was displayed at, at one of these exhibitions. Um, so this is one of the works Rosa created for that. Um, we could see maybe a connection to Artemisia in the sense that it's a deliberately shocking, bloody, disgusting scene meant to um, grab attention. And it, it certainly did, very large, very gory. Um, but he also did works like this that are maybe a little more subtle, um, but got him into a lot of trouble. It's an allegory of fortune. Uh, fortune, as you may know, uh, dispenses her gifts capriciously. Um, they may not go to those who deserve them most and those who deserve them least get the greatest rewards. Uh, here, um, he, and this is based on an allegorical handbook from the time, and cornucopia fortune pours out. Uh, but fortune is giving all the rewards to donkeys and asses and uh, swine who least deserve it, trampling on the arts, pearls before swine. Um, this picture was seen as in, just absolutely insulting to everyone, patrons, fellow artists, even the papal family. He almost got arrested for this painting, but it did create a lot of hype and is one way of um, spreading the word about his work, um, though it wasn't always successful even when uh, works got a lot of attention, didn't mean anyone wanted to buy them. And Salvador Rosa, all he really wanted was to paint altarpieces in churches in Rome, but 
really only got one opportunity and, and it was not very successful. Um, and that, that's this work here, um, which I can't even find a reproduction of. Um, so I wanna just conclude by uh, looking at this work here by an artist whose name we don't actually know. Uh, he's called the Master of the Annunciation to the Shepherds um, after works of that subject. Um, and it is a fascinating painting because it, it shows a painter's studio um, and it shows a very aged painter dressed in kind of raggedy clothing, uh, painting a still life. And to the left is a young boy um, who's just in the earliest stages of his training. Um, it's really unlike any other self-portrait I know. Um, and it's unfortunate we, we don't actually know the artist's name, but it provides a sort of interesting summation of many of the ideas we've been thinking about here. Now on the left, we can see the young boy is drawing um, his eyes in red chalk. Um, it's exactly the sort of thing that Rivera and other artists um, created for their students. So he's at the very earliest stages of his artistic development. That is, he's he just learned to copy other artist drawings. Um, on the other hand, we have the old man who's at the end of his career. He's been a successful painter. Um, and here he's shown not painting a kind of grandiose uh, biblical or literary or mythological subject. Instead, he's painting a still life, imitating nature very closely. We see it right in front of him as he copies it. And here, it, you can actually even read the musical notes um, on this manuscript here, musical instruments, an ancient, well, it's probably a bust by Dukenwa, a skull, musical instruments, a candle, a kind of vanitas image. And we have a little cartelino, a piece of paper in the foreground that says, ancora imparo. That means I'm still learning. Now this is a kind of play on a prince that, that was wrongly attributed to Michelangelo, the idea that even as an old man, you're still learning, hunched over, even as the hourglass is ticking away. But I think there's also something kind of poignant about it, that this is an artist late in his career um, that began maybe like this young boy on the left, but that he has still so much to learn. And I think we can think of it in some ways in context of uh, the Incaminati, that is those travelers who, who on, are on the path to um, achieve unattainable perfection and that even imitating the lowliest parts of nature, even in his advanced age, he's still learning and that this is a process that continues over decades. So thank you. So, and I understand Dan has been collecting questions, so I'm happy to, to answer anything. Anyone wants to talk yes, about Walker, Thank you. Um, I was waiting to be unmuted. So I am at this point, I want to make a comment uh, to begin with, in addition to how, how thrilling it is to listen to your insights, because I know that they've been earned over many years of looking very carefully at, at these works of art, um, that uh, to look at the, the master of the Annunciation uh, with the old man painting from nature and, and the young boy copying the features, uh, you know, red chalk is ideal for uh, editing and, and really kind of idealizing a form. And it's very interesting that this uh, young boy is idealizing while the old man is, is referencing direct observation. Uh, it's almost like a, a split in, in, in two philosophies of learning or something like that. Interesting. Yeah. And I think that ability for correction, you know, is, is you said with red chalk is is part of you know where they talk at this time about you know the young still being sort of pliant or malleable and that that they're still you know forming and that you know these these drawings can be corrected 
again and again if necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Uh, so I have collected a few questions for you, and I, I appreciate your patience with my terrible handwriting as I've attempted to pull these together. I wonder if uh, in your studies, uh, have you encountered much about the education of anatomy in the uh, in the world of training artists going back to the uh, you know the Baroque era? Yeah. Um, I mean, the short answer is, you know, in terms of things like dissections um, at this period, not really, not in Rome. Um, and I think it's because of the climate of the Counter-Reformation, there was a lot of anxiety about sort of dissection and defiling the dead and, and this kind of stuff, what that might mean. So we do see kind of earlier on, say before the 15, 70s or so there's some of that and then a bit later on and then you know outside Rome places like Bologna there, there was a little bit more because of you know the university um, but generally in Rome no I think I think there was just too much anxiety about what it meant to be around the dead to be dissecting and that, that kind of thing. I understand yeah that, that's fine. Um, related to that uh, you mentioned uh, absorbing the perfection of the ancients with the the Belvedere, the Apollo Belvedere and the Belvedere Torso. Uh, there was a question referencing canons of proportion and how how were they acquired? Uh, what sorts of canons might they they have aspired to absorb in their training? Yeah, um, so that that's a complex question, but I would say that that you know it would change over time and in some way the canon of which antiquities were the most perfect and most beautiful um, changed depending on the era. So there were certain times and particularly in say with Michelangelo, we see you know, the Laocoon or, or the Belvedere Torso, these kind of twisting Hellenistic works being the sort of model of perfection. By the time we reach say the 1640s, 1650s, so it's be a kind of turn away from that. And so these works that are perceived to be more Greek as they considered it kind of more, um, well, what we might call classical, you know, kind of serene, graceful um, kind of works became more canonical. And so artists like, like Poussin um, and those around him start to sort of systematize that and, and come up with a kind of canon, you know, measuring the proportions of the sort of works that they saw most beautiful. So this all anticipates, you know, people like Binkelmann in, in the 18th century, um, who separated Greek from Roman art and um, this sort of classical versus Baroque, um, you know, but we do see the beginnings of that in say 1640s and 50s in Rome. Yes, and, and uh, worth noting that uh, the Laocoon is, is still a, uh, a mainstay of, of many academies that there's a, a full-size one at the Pennsylvania Academy that has been there since its inception, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, in parts of, of the Laocoon, as well as the Belvedere Torso, seem to never have gone out of style in, in a curious, enduring way. Yeah, and you can even just the afterlife of a couple of those works, I mean, you can trace them through so many artists from uh, Michelangelo through Rubens up through you know many 18th and 19th century artists still still looking at them. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we've had quite a few questions about Artemisia. Okay, uh, I can handle those. Okay, okay. I I want to ask you uh, a little bit about. Uh, let's see. Linda asks about uh, the episode with uh, Augustino Tassi and the and the rape and essentially how how was. Artemisia able to go on after such a horrific episode in her life? Um, any insights? Yeah. I mean, the short answer in some ways that life was just in part more difficult, I think, in early modern Italy that, um, you know, the violence and, and crime and um, were just much more part of the landscape. Um, in part also, there's been a lot of studies, particularly by Elizabeth Cohen, has looked at, at the trial and talked about kind of rape in the context of 16th and 17th century, what, what it meant legally and as much as we can understand sort of psychologically. But it was just understood very differently, sort of seen as a crime 
as violence against the family, violence against reputation, and understood in a less sort of bodily way um, than, than we might understand it today. Um, but, you know, she was also just a very resilient artist and very talented. And uh, we know from her letters, she just very much stood up for herself and um, was just very tough. <laughs> so um, I think that that's a part of it too. Uh, that goes into another question about her. What do you think from looking at her and studying her, her personality was like? Uh, what do you think uh, some of her views were? Yeah. Now, artist personalities are, are very elusive because we get, on one hand, you know, letters tend to be very kind of formulaic and businesslike um, and, on, and not often line up exactly with how we might interpret the work. Um, recently, a stash of letters by her has emerged that were written to her lover um, in, and with those, she, she does seem very, you do get a sense of her personality, very kind of brash, very argumentative, can be very tender, very hot-headed, um, but still kind of a mystery. Um, there, there's just a lot of contradictions there. So I think she's a very complicated person, um, but one who I definitely would not want to cross. Um, <laughs> I had, if you made her angry, she, she really made it known. I, I, I understand. Um, there, there have been several other questions. I, I wanted to dovetail into some things related to her. At what point were the models and the training open to both women as well as men? Do you, did it go on throughout the century and it never ceased? Or? Um, I mean, I, officially women were not allowed at these events, but there are accounts that suggest, uh, there's one by Zandrart, a German writer who knew Artemisia in, in Naples, um, who said that she did in fact attend one of those. There was a kind of famous Academia del Nudo um, held in Naples by the artist Daniela Falcone, and he says that she she attended that. Um, so that's really the only evidence we have that women were at them at all, um, and it's hard to know how to how to interpret that. I mean, how do we see that in her drawings? Um, the other issue that related to that that I didn't bring up, I mean, is the question of you know female nudes are are very common in art of, of this time, but women were never models at these life drawing sessions. So it was usually either through the wives of artists or hiring prostitutes was not that uncommon for that purpose. Um, the one advantage Artemisia had was of course access to, to women and that's probably one of the reasons why her female nudes are, are so much more compelling uh, than many other artists of the time. Yeah, that is interesting because you uh, I did watch your presentation on the Cleopatra painting, which mm -hmm. is obviously a female nude or a female partial nude by uh, by Artemisia. Um, there was a question about uh, from John. It looks like how did Artemisia avoid the wrath of Ribera in Naples after he chased Karachi out of the city? Yeah. Um, so to anyone who's not familiar with that, there's a kind of supposedly a kind of cabal of painters in um, Naples who would threaten or chase out various other artists they, they didn't like. Um, that's a good question. She seems to have been easily sort of absorbed into the community there. A lot of it had to do often with sort of family connections. Maybe she was seen as in some ways not a threat. Um, and she seems to have collaborated with other Neapolitan painters. Um, so. She was successful there and, and pretty easily welcomed, um, but there's not any really obvious reason that, that I can figure out why, why they didn't mind having her there. Mm, okay. Now you are uh, asked, called upon, uh, consulted for authentication of Artemisia Gentileschi paintings, are you not? Yeah. Do you encounter many forgeries of her work? Um, I would say forgeries just because um, historically just she hasn't been that famous. Um, 
in that, why would anyone bother to forge her work? I think maybe more recently, what's more likely is that there are some very optimistic attributions and people might say, I think I have an Artemisia. And most of the time I say no, but you know, once in a while, I agree that, that it is. Um, but you know, you, for forgeries, you generally need to be more sort of worth money. So forging Vermeer's or Rembrandt's or um, Caravaggio's might make you some cash, but um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe things are changing now. I guess it's a sign that you really made it when people want to forge your work. Yes, unfortunately, I haven't gotten any yet myself. So I'm, <laughs> okay, well, I hope you do. <laughs> uh, Steve Bennett uh, puts optimistic attributions in the, in the chat box. Uh, I, I, I asked this question for two reasons. Uh, the first of which I wanted to tactfully insert into our conversation that we, we have a board member uh, of uh, Studio Incaminati who somewhat famously was able to uh, identify a Guercino painting that he purchased, which was not attributed to a Guercino, but he knew the marks, you know, he knew mm -hmm. the calligraphy and the handwriting of the artist. And, and I, uh, he's, he's a great guy, an actor named Federico Castelluccio. But I wanted to ask you, uh, as an art historian, uh, where do you find the most interest in your field? Is it studying the visual mark making? Is it writing about the, the lives? Is it getting into the biographies or attempting to decipher their personalities? What do you find the most engaging and why? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it's really kind of the mystery of, you know, trying to, trying to solve a puzzle and, and that can come from many different directions. It might be something you see in a painting, whether it's, it is say the mark making or some kind of something in the subject matter that intrigues you and you realize, well, there's got to be something more to this. And, you know, the process of kind of tracing each element, whether it's visual elements or, you know, finding textual sources, kind of digging into things that maybe no one has. I think that's kind of the most exciting part. It's a little bit different, you know, in the age of COVID, um, we end up doing a lot of our research based on books and on, you know, all sorts of great stuff has been archived by Google and Internet Archive. Um, so digging through texts can be fun, but, you know, obviously it doesn't compare to the kinds of questions that arise when you're actually in a church or in a museum um, looking at the works and you ask very different kinds of questions. So, you know, the appeal kind of changes depending on which angle you're approaching it from. So what you're alluding to is the, it, the, the secrets, the, the things that you, you find, uh, like the coat of arms for the family, which I can't remember the name of, in, in the painting of the death of Cleopatra. Did you ever uh, decipher that mystery? Yeah, so that was, there's some connection to the Borromini family in Milan, but I, that's one that's defeated me for the moment. Maybe someday I'll go back to Milan and, and find something. But I think everyone I know who's an art historian keeps, you know, you have this little file, even in your mind of little things that someday I'll figure out this little puzzle. And sometimes you do and, and maybe usually you don't, but that's okay. Yes. Um, I wanted to comment that uh, your point about the models, uh, trying to find the perfect model, uh, as opposed to not, you know, contriving or confecting something out of your imagination was a really subtle one, but a really good one. Uh, because you were talking about this, in some respect, the split uh, of uh, making nature the prevailing aesthetic guiding point, uh, as opposed to an idealism. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. And I have a follow up question. Sure. I mean, this is one of the kind of dividing principles in, um, in I mean, presumably in ancient art, but certainly in, in Renaissance up through 19th century art is this question of sort of realism versus idealism, whether you sort of collect the best from nature and um, perfect it through artistic skill and, and imagination or whether you're faithful to nature as it appears. And um, 
you know, there's a spectrum within the period we're talking about. Karachi and their followers are usually put more in the idealist, Caravaggio more, let's see, in the realist. But um, even Caravaggio does improve and perfect his creations. You know, the, the more extreme artists were um, probably the northern artists who, who would, you know, like to paint sort of warts and all. Um, but in Italy, that tradition was never quite as strong as it was in Northern Europe. Okay, the tradition of, of referencing life versus idealism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because my follow-up question uh, requires some amount of speculation on your part, because I know it's not necessarily your primary focus, but these days in art education, our, our uh, back and forth more often deals with the photograph versus life. Mm -hmm imagery. So it, it it's not an easy nut to crack because there may be a lot of idealism thrown back into interpretations of the photograph or idealism in interpretations from from life. I mean, for example, some of the some of those figures that you showed, uh, whether they were Artemisia or others, they seemed imbued with a sense of idealistic interpretation of the model. So um, maybe I can't articulate my question. Uh, maybe I just want to bent a little bit, but I, it's, it, the, the, uh, the tug of war goes on, I, I have to say, between, um, you know, working out of your head or working from an image, and if that image is a, an image that's frozen versus an image that's three-dimensional, various mechanics are, are involved, which, which keep teaching very dynamic. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, from the 17th century perspective, I, I think they would see that you know copying from nature itself was was superior in their mind um but certainly borrowing and sort of synthesizing the works of of other artists um was was a huge part of their practice um so i think in the sort of classical idealist school they would see a sort of combination of those you know if you on one hand don't reference nature at all it becomes kind of mannered and artificial and divorced from um, real experience. On the other, you know, they would see it as becoming too grotesque, too um, sort of earthbound and, and not, not using enough art is really how they would see it. Yeah, this, this, this point you're landing on right now is, is one of the reasons why these lectures have been so important for our community because these are very big questions. You know, how, how much do you insert your own interpretation of visual phenomenon? How much do you um, assert your voice? And, mm. and how much do you reference the kind of um, unassailable beauty of nature and the ingenuity of, of your own mind? Um, these, are, these are things that I think our community would be uh, surprised and intrigued to know artists of the past had to deal with in, in just as robust a manner, but under different conditions in a sense, right? Yeah, and I think for them, it could even have a kind of moral valence and, you know, in that Caravaggism by some was seen as too close to kind of sort of atomism, a kind of heresy that, that the decay of the universe was sort of being celebrated rather than the sort of eternal timeless perfection created by God. So it, it almost had a philosophical, theological dimension to it. That takes us back to anatomy then, doesn't it, right? I guess so, yeah. Well, this, this has been uh, just absolutely fantastic. I, um, uh, unless there are any more questions to come through the chat, anybody? Uh, we're getting a lot of thank yous. I myself want to thank uh, Stephen Allen Bennett and Elaine Melody Schmidt for um, underwriting the series uh, once again and, and giving us such an enriching uh, conversation, which really does fuel our work. I mean, these conversations they endure and they inspire us to, to reach new heights. So I thank you ever so much, Dr. Locker, for, uh, for being here tonight. Is there anything you'd like to close on or anything? Well, I'd just uh, like to uh, thank all of you for coming, even if it only meant, you know, coming to the living room or the basement. Um, I, I appreciate it. And I'm sorry we couldn't come uh, all the way to Philadelphia as uh, we'd originally planned uh, back in April, but um, it's really nice for me to to hear your questions and and i'm really grateful to all of you uh, for making this happen so thank you your basement in my attic 
and uh, <laughs> you'll have to make me a promise that when you get back to the East Coast, maybe go by Hopkins, you'll you'll pay us a visit. I'd love to give you a tour, and if, if you'd uh, you know if you'd enjoy seeing our interpretation of the of the past meets the present and the future, we really appreciate that. Yeah, very much. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. you. You're welcome. Thank you so much.